Okay, there we go. So, uh, hi everyone. For folks who don't know me, uh, my name is Sophia Ross. I use they and them pronouns, um, and I work for Capitol Hill Village. Uh, we are a nonprofit that is located in Washington, D.C., specifically in the Capitol Hill neighborhood. Um, we're one of 13 villages in Washington, D.C. Um, we happen to be the uh, largest of the D.C. villages. Um, and we currently have about 400 members and over 200 volunteers, I believe. Um, and I have been with the village for the last three years, and uh, I can just say it's a, a fantastic organization. Um, the purpose of what we do here is to help support older adult residents uh, in aging in their homes for as long as possible. Uh, and this is something that has been around for a very long time, but now has been formalized into a, a nonprofit organization um, setting. So um, I'm very fortunate to also be supporting the work that we've been doing focused on LGBT older adults, in addition to my other hats that I wear with the village. Um, and this event specifically is part of a series of events um, that we are we have conducted over this past year and will continue into next year. Um, that are focused specifically on promoting information related to LGBT inclusion in senior living communities um, and emphasizing the importance of being able to provide community members uh, with this information in an accessible way, accessible format, uh, and helping to take this guesswork out of um, trying to find a community if someone needs it um, that will be inclusive and welcoming. So um, it's just a pleasure to have everyone here today who's been involved in this panel um, and who's, who's committed to uh, wanting to focus on LGBT inclusion and aging spaces. Um, and I hope that today's event uh, can just help other organizations uh, continue this conversation um, and to just recognize how important it is for us uh, as aging providers to be having these conversations. So um, without further ado, I'm going to give us a very brief rundown of our panel, and then we are going to dive into things. Um, and respectfully, I would ask that uh, anyone who's in attendance, please save any questions you may have for the Q&A portion, because that'll just be easier for us to try to make sure everybody can get their questions answered um, in a timely manner and that we don't miss anyone. So uh, if you have a burning question, grab a piece of paper, write it down. I promise we will make sure we get to it uh, when we do the Q&A. But so first, we're going to start off with uh, a little get to know you um, from our different CCRCs that we have with us today. Uh, and then my lovely co-moderator, Dr. Jennifer Marana, and I will be um, bouncing some questions off of our panelists, um, which again, you will get introduced to shortly. Uh, and then for the rest of the event, we will have time for the Q&A. And so um, we'll have approximately about um, an hour and 15 minutes or so, maybe a little bit less um, for this beginning portion. And then again, the remainder will be Q&A. So um, I am now going to pass the mic to uh, Dr. Marana, and I will let you take it from there if you'd like to introduce yourself. Um, and then I will, we will pass it on to our panelists so they can introduce themselves. Wonderful. Good afternoon, everyone. I am Jennifer Moranya, and I am a consultant, a diversity consultant working primarily with um, CCRCs on their diversity journeys. Prior to um, going into full-time consulting, I served as Broadmead's first vice president for diversity, equity, and inclusion. Broadmead is a CCRC located in Cockeysville, Maryland. Um, so I served in that role for um, several years before moving into consulting with different organizations. So I am excited to be with you uh, because it's such an important topic that we're delving into today. And I'm excited, um, you know, for us to hear from our esteemed panelists. 
So Sophia, you want me to go ahead and call um, on someone to introduce themselves? Sure, I'm just getting everybody spotlighted so they can uh, be front and center here. Perfect, perfect. Should we start with Cody? Cody Christian from Ingleside. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Cody Christian. I'm the Director of Accreditation and Quality Improvement with Ingleside. I am also the co-chair of our Diversity, Equity, Inclusion, and Belonging Committee called Ingleside in Color, which I'll get into a little bit more later. Um, I've been with Ingleside for about eight years in various roles. So I started off as the Fitness and Wellness Director, and then I got my license as a nursing home administrator. So I was overseeing healthcare services for a number of years. And now I'm at the parent organization, Ingosab, that has three life plan communities across the DMV, where I do the accreditation and quality improvement work. Um, and I'm happy to be a part of this panel today. Thanks, Cody. Joshua Runkle Runkles from Riderwood. Yeah, thank you so much. I'm the sales director here at Riderwood. A uh, little background, about 20 years ago, I stumbled into one of our sister communities called Oak Crest over in Parkville. Um, that's under the Erickson umbrella and no intention of ever working for the organization. I just really fell in love with the culture and said that day, I, I will work here. Within a couple of weeks, I started as an intern. Again, that was 20 years ago. Worked at Oak Crest for a little over 17 years came over to Riderwood as sales director um, just two years ago. Riderwood's located, for those that don't know, in Silver Spring, right outside of D.C. We are the biggest CCRC in the U.S. We have 1,773 um, apartments here in independent living alone. Um, we have we moved about 235 households in last year. They're on pace to do about the same this year. And because we have so many residents, you know, over 1,400 residents, uh, I'm sorry, 2,400 residents, 1,400 staff, there's just so much diversity here and so much great culture. And that gives us the ability to have over 250 resident-run groups here. So a little bit of everything. Uh, when we promote the community, it's really nice to say, whatever it is that you're interested in, I'm pretty sure we have it here. And if we don't have it here, we're going to find it for you. So certainly love working here. I'm going to spend a lot of time today talking about Priderwood, which is our resident staff run group here. Brought a couple special guests with me as well, who um, if you want to take a minute, just introduce yourself. We have Brian Cohen, who is our um, resident service coordinator. And I brought a Riderwood resident with me as well, Dr. LJ. So if you guys could wave, maybe, maybe do a quick introduction, Brian. Yep. Hi, thank you. Thanks for um, inviting me, Sophia. Good to be in touch um, over the years. So I'm Brian Cohen. I'm one of the social workers here on our campus. We are resident service coordinators, and we actually provide support to our residents as they age here in their homes and as they might need more support and services over their lifetime here. I've been with the company now nine years and will say I love what I do here. So I am I've uh, been in the field for 23 years, and most of that has been working with LGBTQ, or not LGBTQ specific, but older adults. Um, but here at Riderwood, I've actually been able to um, run and co-chair our LGBTQ plus and allies subcommittee, which is a part of our larger diversity, inclusion, and belonging committee. And we have been going on for a good strong three years now. So we do a, quite a bit here on the campus to make sure our LGBTQ plus um, older adults feel welcomed. Um, along with our residents and staff. Yeah, I think Josh wanted me to introduce myself. I'm LJ Ingram. Um, I've uh, lived here, my wife and I have lived here for a year and a half. I feel like we've been here a lot longer because for the seven years prior to that, uh, my parents have been living here and my mother is now uh, progressed at the age of 95 into needing our continuing care. Uh, she's in assisted living, um, but as a remaining as a, anyway, so on the LGBTQ front, um, <laughs> I'm sorry, you know, with the modern things that are being said about LG, LGBTQ in society, I'm transgender and um, I have found nothing to make me feel unsafe at Riderwood. 
Uh, Priderwood is a safe space community, and this is one of the significant reasons that we moved here. And I am as well on the subcommittee that Brian made mention of. But uh, if you want to ask me questions later, I'm here to answer. Thank you. And thank you for redesigning your living room for us. It's beautiful. <laughs> thank you so much. Wonderful. And we also have Jonathan Chafin from Sunrise. Welcome, Jonathan. Go ahead. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, honored to be here. My name is Jonathan. I use he, him pronouns. Um, I've been with Sunrise on Connecticut Avenue for uh, a little over 12 years now. Uh, my background is as a music therapist. So that's why I started with our um, activities and programming team here. And then I'm, I'm currently in grad school over at Georgetown in the aging and health program. Um, and so moved into the director of sales role about a year and a half ago um, when, the, when the position opened up in the community. Uh, Sunrise has been a leader in assisted living for over 40 years. Um, our community here in Northwest DC has been around about 19 years. Um, and as opposed to the life plan communities that, that are also on the panel, we are just assisted living, uh, but because there aren't a lot of true um, independent living options in DC, we have some residents that are um, independent as well, just slightly different offerings. So we'll be coming a little bit from a different perspective from, from that side as well um, this afternoon. But we also offer a memory care in the community as well. We have two neighborhoods of memory care, um, about nine, a little over 90 residents in the community today um, and 100 units in, in the community um, as well. Wonderful, thank you. Um, really quickly, I do want to make sure, Cody, uh, if you want to use this time as well, since everybody else seemed to combine their time to talk about their community, make sure we don't miss out on that before we dive into questions. So, Sure, thank you. Um, so I mentioned we have three life plan communities um, under Ingleside. One is in like Friendship Heights, Chevy Chase, D.C. Then we have one in Rockville, Maryland, and then one in Lake Ridge, Virginia. Um, we combined have around 13 to 1400 residents, um, approximately 700 staff. Our, um, we have the full continuum of care from independent living, assisted living, then memory support assisted living, skilled nursing with long-term, short-term rehab and memory care. Um, so we have the full continuum at our communities. Um, we also have Ingleside at Home as one of our organizations where we have home health, as well as an, uh, a foundation. Um, so really kind of five point organizations under the umbrella. And I, again, I am spent most of my time at Ingleside at King Farm in Rockville as the director of healthcare services and the prior fitness wellness director. Um, but now I'm at the parent corporation um, Ingleside, which is all located in Rockville, Maryland. Um, and our, when we get more into our committees and our efforts, we have an overarching um, committee that is kind of collaborated amongst all of our life plan communities. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about that when we get to those, those questions. Thank you. All right, so Sophia, we're ready to move on to additional questions. Yes, and I would just note for a moment there, your audio was a little garbled, but I think, I think it's probably fine. Um, but yeah, I think I think go ahead with our first question. All right. So for our three panelists, do LGBT plus residents have ways to express their needs and preferences? And if so, what feedback have you received from LGBT plus residents? Let's see. Uh, do I call you out or does anyone want to go ahead and begin? I yeah. can certainly begin, Josh, at Riderwood. Um, so I will say one of the strengths at Riderwood is in our number, is, is in the fact that we have so much diversity here. And one of the things I mentioned is Priderwood. Um, the, it's a resident staff group that puts on different events all throughout the year. Literally, I could sit here and talk to you for a, a long time about that. But what I'd love to do is just share a little clip with you. Um, to give you a, a vibe of what, what that community has done this year. So give me just a second here to share.
So who's ready to move in? <laughs> no, I think that's a, a really nice um, example of just one of the events that, that we put on throughout the year. So we have different speakers come in. Brian, if you want to add a little bit to Priderwood, Brian actually started Priderwood here at the community three years ago. So what, what types of events do we have coming up, Brian? So just to speak a little bit on Priderwood, and I love LJ to share her perspective as a resident um, to sort of answer the question. But we started Priderwood, like um, Josh was saying, three years ago. We actually did it because we partnered with Sage Care and brought some training to our staff on some of the issues and things that our LGBTQ resident staff may be faced with as they're moving into a CCRC. So that was sort of the initiative that led to us starting a LGBTQ plus specific subcommittee here at Riderwood. We have over the years, and I've been here nine years, always looked at addressing diversity and inclusion amongst a variety of minorities in groups that are represented here on campus. So there's a lot of things happening on campus every year. As far as Pride, we actually focus a lot of our events during June, Pride Month, of course, but do also look at other dates throughout the year and do activities and events throughout the year. So some of the things that we've actually done here on campus and which we do a lot during June is we do the Pride Parade, of course, on campus. We've had that for three years now. We actually started Pride or Wood, um, tried to start it um, at the beginning of the pandemic. But of course, when the pandemic started, we, we did not do that. But we started it up officially in 2021 and we had our first parade then. And then every year it's just gotten bigger and bigger. So the, the video clip you saw was actually the second time we had drag queens represented at our Pride Parade and actually invited three drag queens out this year. So that was pretty exciting that every year it just keeps getting bigger. We also host a LGBTQ themed movie series and, and play movies throughout um, the year on our Right of Wood TV and also in our Encore movie theater that we have on campus. Um, we have a variety of speakers come in and talk about different topics. We've done um, Coming Out Day in October, where we've done a movie showing and a panel. Um, so those are just a couple things that we do. We are in the process of planning for the you know summer, so we really haven't gotten into what specifically we're doing, but we're looking at an LGBTQ plus um, 101 event to continue education to um, all of our campus. We have a lot of folks here that are allies and want education on how to support their loved ones that might identify as LGBT. So we do a lot of focus on that as well and have several groups that have formed um, outside of Pride or Wood um, and they are resident run, some staff run. We have an LGBTQ plus um, support and discussion group that two of our residents run on campus here. So there's a lot of opportunity for our residents to voice their needs and, and concerns on campus. Um, with each other. Uh, and so that's just a little bit. I could keep talking. There's there's a lot that's going on over here, and I'm sure we'll talk about that throughout conversation coming up. And LJ, if you want to add to that. Thank you, Brian. Um, yeah, you you uh, pretty well covered uh, Priderwood and um, uh, Pride Month very well. Uh, but yet, uh, for me, one thing that's important is my uh, my spiritual life. And so for the first time this year during Pride Month, we had in our chapel an affirmation service. And um, I know that that's one place where my immediate members who are now allies because of their living around me and getting to experience who I am and how I just want to live life, uh, they really, really appreciated uh as an ally going to this affirmation service. But this is another thing about needs. Um, as I may mention earlier, um, you know, transgender people have a special thing as we age in place. Uh, we have a medical history and the medical history is a part of who we are. Uh, the medical center totally accepts me who I am. From the uh, receptionist all the way through to the medical staff, all the way to the staff that are providing and helping my mom in assisted living. That's so the, the spiritual and the physical, 
but there are other needs that I need. And it's more than just LGBTQ. I fit into the entire Riderwood community. I live in a park. We have wonderful acreage. We have eight different restaurants. We have a wellness center with a gym and swimming pool. No, no place have I been on campus and told you don't belong here. Another thing about needs that's more than just us. Um, we have people here that may have grandchildren who are coming out. So once a month, we have a group that provide uh, an, an open uh, Q&A session where people can come and ask questions. How do I interact with my grandchild? What is this non-binary thing? I don't understand that. So we're reaching out to the people who have family members who are coming out as well. Thank you. Thank you so much. And really, you know, from a sales perspective, we, we certainly have the, the pride heart, you know, on every piece of material or invitation that we send out to prospective people looking at the campus. You saw behind LJ, the safe space, you know, that that's on all of our doors. But thank you for sharing your story, because that to me is what's going to, you know, we'll, we'll certainly bring people in and let them know that they're welcome. But to hear from you that you saw that and you heard that, I, I really appreciate that. Yeah, thank you. I just want to make a comment about Sage Care um, that Brian mentioned that they had partnered with. Sage Care, for those of you um, that um, have not heard of that before, it they offer training and credentialing for um, CCRCs, for, for um, senior living organizations to provide training um, and equip staff with the knowledge and um, just understanding of how they can better um, serve the needs of LGBTQ plus um, older adults. And so, so what you'll find on some of the CCRC websites is some, the Sage Care symbol um, on their website. And you'll know that um, different CCRCs have had staff go through the training and they're credentialed with, with having that um, training. So, all right, uh, let's see. Next up, Jonathan, you wanna go ahead? Yeah, um, to go back to the question of, you know, having needs and preferences met, I think an important part of our process uh, is the assessment process. So especially because we are assisted living, uh, you would meet with our nurse, uh, all residents meet with the nurse um, during that move-in process. It's a good opportunity to raise those concerns, to raise any kinds of, of care concerns, like LJ was mentioning. It's a very different kind of care uh, for someone um, that may be transgender, or maybe again, someone that's... Um, gain and then having some HIV kinds of treatment. So those are those good opportunities to bring those up uh, with our team to make sure that we're aware of what that schedule and routine is, making sure that we're adequately meeting that need from the care perspective. Um, so from, from day one, before you even step in the door, we're making sure that, that those kinds of concerns are, are brought up um, with our team as well. Um, we've um, only had a few LGBTQ residents over the years. Um, but most are very comfortable making their needs known. Uh, and we mentioned allies um, as well. And I think that's the other really important side to the story too, um, is that sometimes residents don't always feel comfortable outing themselves, so to speak. Uh, and so how do we make sure that they're still comfortable and, and that we're still including them uh, and not making them feel that, they, that they're excluded in any kind of way? Um, so allies are a really important part of that. Again, making sure to have pride flags around, not just around um, pride season in June, but, but around the year, making sure, um, as Joshua was saying, that, that, that our inclusivity is showcased uh, for those residents as well, so that they don't feel like they have to bring it up, um, that, that they know, again, before they even step in the door, that this is a great home for them. Um, and with that, too, I think as, as residents have progressed uh, through their journey with, with uh, memory loss, um, that's where those allies are really important, too. How do we... Um, make sure to support those residents, because uh, one of our residents right now that is LGBTQ is in our memory care. Um, and, and his friends that are supportive of him are really important in making sure that his needs are met too. Um, so again, making sure to have education for our team. So back to Sage Care, like you mentioned, Dr. Jen, um, as well as making sure that our allies feel comfortable bringing those concerns up too. Thank you. Cody. So I'm probably going to mimic a lot of what was already shared, um, but I would like to mention like person-centered care philosophy, looking at each person as an individual, and that's how we operate, whether that's how we 
create a program, how we provide care, the meals we serve, it goes into every aspect of the operation. Um, all of our Ingleside communities are CAR for credited, which is the Commission on Rehabilitation Facilities. And it's a standard of practice that is surveyed that we are committed to going above and beyond to have that um, person-centered care philosophy and that we have established diversity, equity, and inclusion and belonging plans and strategies behind it. So really committing fully to the mission that's surrounding our committee and our work um, is something that's been very powerful and successful for us. Um, so for residents to be able to express their needs is we need to create a place where people feel comfortable and um, as an organization, we need to be transparent and vulnerable so that our residents and our staff can be transparent and vulnerable with what their needs are so we can adjust things appropriately. So we do that through our committee. We do it through different workshops and programs. We have like our resident satisfaction survey, our employee satisfaction survey. Um, getting all those metrics really helps us a lot. Um, but again, we have to make it sure people feel comfortable to express honestly in their feedback. Um, so that's why I always really kind of touch on um, what Leading Age Maryland has really ran with, um, and Jennifer's helps lead that um, charter as well, but adding the B in DEI, the belonging piece, you can include them as much as you want in your programs or in marketing materials, but if they don't sense that they belong, they could be there, but they don't have that, that, that internal feeling, then the success is kind of mitigated to what our end goal is, really. Um, so, along with our committee and our surveys, we obviously have like the open door policy to make sure people feel that whenever they have a concern, we are here to listen to them. Um, and really looking again at the holistic picture, obviously our focus today is LGBT plus, but it's looking at the person that of a whole, not just that part of the, them as a person, um, but sitting and giving them the space to be able to share the nuances specific to them. Um, so I think that really kind of showcases our different efforts around making sure people feel um, that they can express their needs, that we hear them, and then we actually take action once we hear them. Beautiful. Thank you all. So I, I hope you heard there's so much richness in, in um, what each of the communities shared and, and how they are supporting their LGBTQ residents. It's really, you know, committees, the groups, um, the support, the activities, um, even surveys, and, and that person-centered care, right, for everybody um, who comes to, you know, whatever location you choose, that you are seen for who you are as an individual and, you know, whatever your needs may be. So thank you all. Sophia. Yeah, and Cody, kind of to uh, bounce off what you were saying with belonging, the second question we have, I think, really kind of digs into that as well, um, which was just uh, for, I, we will probably go in the same order um, for the rest of the questions, but um, starting with Josh and the other folks at Riderwood, um, does your community have policies regarding bullying, discrimination, harassment, and other um, actions that might fall under these categories uh, by residents um, or staff. And uh, the follow-up to that is, if you do not, um, is there any reason why? And uh, this is kind of a three-part question, but um, have you had to enforce these policies or are you aware of any incidents that may uh, have occurred? So just diving deeper into um, you know, the experience of residents in your communities. Yeah, thank you, Sophia. Uh, we certainly do have policies around bullying, uh, around discrimination. The, the good news is that the, the culture that we are creating here, we don't really have issues. You know, I have not seen issues beyond a, a written letter at times, you know, maybe somebody mentioned something in a dining room. But because we are, it's like a big family, regardless of there th being thousands of people here, it truly is a big family. Uh, we promote at, at a corporate level to, if you see something, say something. If there happens to be an issue, bring it up with somebody and it will be addressed. We also do the, you know, 
twice a, a year surveys where we do solicit this feedback. And it, it's not a survey that just gets thrown away. We do analyze all of those results, really pay attention to any common themes and, and sort of address those things before they would even become an issue. Uh, I look at, you know, like uh, Cody was saying, Sure, people come in and they they trust that that we're going to be accepting. But what do we do? Where's the action behind that? So in the last couple of years, we actually started a program called Live the Life, where somebody will come in and say, "Okay, well you're you're saying a lot. You're making a lot of promises. How do I know? How do I know when I get to your community it will be that way?" So now we can actually say, "Well, how about this? Why don't you come stay with us for three days and two nights? We'll put you up in one of our apartments here." We'll pair you up with like-minded residents. If you want to play pickleball one day, we'll set you up to do that. If you want to have breakfast out on the courtyard, you can do that too. But we have found that to be so powerful so that you can come in and just experience the community and what our residents and, and staff, you know, are, what, what, you know, showing them that, that everything that we're saying today hopefully is true and they find that to be true. And then my thing is, if they experience that and they, they're not happy with the community, good. It, it, it was good that they found that out as well. I want it to be an experience that you're going to be happy with. I want you to be happy moving in. And I want to be happy with the decision we made for you to enter the community as well. Because honestly, if there are any of those themes, better to find them out in those three days, right? And realize that you're, you're not going to be a great addition to the community. And that conversation is okay, too. So to be able to kind of, um, you know, really set up that culture and that expectation from the beginning, I think is why we've been so successful as a community. Thank you, Josh. Um, and I, the I have to know. I think that's uh, your CCRC is the only one I've heard of doing this program, um, and it's pretty unique. Uh, and it's great that you all are able to um, have the resources to be able to. Uh, provide folks with the opportunity to experience that um, instead of, you know, just stopping at, oh, you can only talk at, um, talk to a representative or go on a tour uh, or, you know, check out a website. So, yeah. And it, yeah. along those lines, another thing we've been doing, I wanted to give Brian, I want to give you an opportunity to mention this as well. Uh, we have a series going on right now. It's called Belonging Begins With You. So, Brian, can you just take a minute and just go over what, what that program looks like? Yeah, uh, and so I'll talk about it briefly just because I'm not heavily involved with this piece. It is something that our larger diversity, inclusion, and belonging committee is um, spearheading. And they just kicked it off this month with a couple keynote speakers from our um, overall board of um, Erickson Living. So they came out and, and talked about the importance of inclusion and belonging and how do we practice that? How do we make sure to create spaces for people? And we are focusing on a couple specific um, groups at Riderwood to do what we're calling a walk in my shoes where those residents in the club um, come and speak about their experiences within the community, within their past, um, growing up. So um, just to name a couple of the groups that we're going to be speaking throughout the month, we have our Chinese American Club speaking. We have an ABLE committee, which encompasses a variety of groups that talk about um, low hearing, um, physical disability or limitations, um, vision loss, um, sensitivity, sensitivity to smells. So that committee is speaking about how they assess and address the needs of, of residents that have a variety of needs um, and abilities. We have our Wrightwood Jewish community speaking and African American History Club speaking as well. So that's just a little bit about that. And then we close it out with another keynote speaker at the end of the month. And one of those first presentations, Brian, was done by uh, Pam Steiner, Associate Executive Director, where it was it was just all about being a good neighbor, right? You're here now. You This is community living. This is how you be. A good, it, it sounds pretty simple, and, and it is for the most part, but just to really, you know, have a space for people to learn about community living, uh, to express any concern they might have. I think if you continue to provide those venues, everything goes just a little bit smoother. Yeah, thank you, uh, Brian and Josh. I want to turn it over to uh, Jonathan to answer the same question, focusing on um, community policies you might have and 
anything you can share if you've had to enforce these policies or if any incidents have occurred at your community. Oh, you are on mute. I'm so sorry. Thought I was pressing the space bar. Sorry about that. <laughs> um, but yes, I um, kind of like Joshua and Brian were mentioning it, a lot of it starts from the culture of the community itself. Um, and Sunrise as a company, you know, our, our principles of service talk about celebrating individuality, enabling freedom of choice, nurturing the spirit. So those are big themes, um, but, but ideas we want to incorporate throughout the day to day. Um, and residents are handed a handbook uh, from the minute they walk in the door um, and a very open door policy in our community. Our executive director, she's right on the first floor, any kind of issues that come up, um, always very accessible and reachable to residents. Um, we have not had any formal complaints um, over the years, uh, but a lot of that too, uh, uh, back to like what Josh was saying, is serving the residents. You know, it puts a lot of pressure on some on residents sometimes to speak up for themselves. So making sure that we're doing our jobs as leaders of the community to check in with our residents, making sure that they're comfortable, um, just kind of casually checking in so that, so that when things do come up, um, they know who who to raise it to. Um, we also have, um, as a assisted living, the, the ombudsman uh, is, is a part of our regulations and re we let residents know that they are a resource for residents when they have complaints. So they can reach out to the ombudsman. They're a great in-between um, between the residents and the community as well. Um, and kind of lastly too, you know, there's uh, educating our team. Um, there was one incident where there's some Christian music that was playing in an open space where one of our LGBTQ residents was, and it was getting to be a little bit um, preachy. Uh, and that resident has, with their history, felt very uh, persecuted by the, by the church in some ways. And so making sure to educate our team to say, hey, this is not appropriate in this common setting for this resident. Um, and, and again, educating our team on that matter too. Thank you for sharing. Um, and I I also want to take note of the point where you, everybody's talked a lot about this already, but the person-centered care and making sure that, um, you know, there is this follow through and checking in and um, being responsive really is uh, vital and in, in creating, um, you know, welcoming environments. So that's great to hear. And um, Cody, do you, do you have anything to add? Sure, I have a few things. So yes, we do have um, policies in place and we, as the best practices, I'm sure the other people on the panel do, review our policies annually. And there are some nuances we want to look at our policies from a DEI lens. So um, one thing I want to share is Ingleside, our three communities um, participated um, in the Long-Term Care Equality Index, which was a partnership with SAGE and the Human Rights Campaign. And we, all three communities, got high performer status, which is great. Um, and that whole, it was a lengthy process to um, go through. Um, but part of that is having specific language in your policies. So as opposed to just having sexual orientation, you have gender identity. Um, so it's really taking a different um, lens when you think of policies and making sure if that's your foundational guide and that's what you're supposed to operate out of, are we being inclusive in how we develop those? Um, so we definitely take a look at that and it's something that's definitely grown in the last couple years. Um, so we really look at our anti-harassment, discrimination, our visitation policies, um, and we are always going to kind of be again, looking at it from a different perspective and always learning as we know DEIB um, is not stagnant. It's always kind of evolving. We learn all the time. None of us are complete experts in all of the different um, categories. So we have to be willing and take the time to really um, invest in our policies and our practices and really the implementation of those. Because again, as everyone's kind of talked, it's not about just having the policy or the committee, it's creating that culture that's um, being lived within the community. Um, we haven't had a ton of issues um, in regards to problems, um, whether it's from residents or external stakeholders um, in regards to our efforts. Um, 
some people may have voiced that they may not be comfortable participating in a pride event, but so they won't go to it, but they'll still be supportive that that is something that's offered within the setting. Um, so I think because we've established a culture within our marketing and our sales, and when you come in, you know that is part of our nature and our spirit as an organization, they have a more of an understanding basis behind it, but they're not always involved or engaged. So I would say that sometimes is a nuance. It's minimal, but it, it is a part of the picture at times. Um, so, yeah. Yeah, th thank you for the um, transparency on that. And we do want to hear about, you know, the spectrum of, um, you know, what it what is what it looks like to be in your different communities. So um, not just hearing all about, um, you know, what is working, what is happening. It's important to talk about those challenges and those, you know, difficulties that, you know, have come up. So um, Dr. Jen, are you ready for our next question? Ready, ready to go. So the next question revolves around training and we did touch on um, sage care earlier. So I wanna give you um, the opportunity to just talk more. What what does training look like um, for your organizations um, when it comes to staff? Um, are you providing training? Um, are, are you, you know, like I said, we talked about sage care before, but talk a little bit more about what that looks like um, to better address the needs of LGBTQ residents. Uh, Jonathan, J Josh, go ahead. Yeah, absolutely. So we we have gone through SAGE training. My biggest takeaway from the SAGE trainings that I've been involved in here is really, if you look at Riderwood, you have three different generations coming in, right? So learning about each generation and what it means to each person and the some of the situations that somebody that, that was born in 1903 you know, went through and just understanding that, understanding the big step that, that they took even coming to community living, um, understanding their reservations, really, you know, giving, it just gave me a new perspective for when I meet with somebody that comes onto the campus. Uh, so that that's always going to stick with me for sure. I think it's our partnership here with the residents um, through Priderwood, the opportunity um, to, to pair incoming residents up with our current residents and have those conversations um, Dr. LG, I know that we, we've had you meet with, even on the phone, just call prospective residents just to um, talk through some of these things. And just learning from them has been one of the biggest things for me, you know, developing those relationships and, and just walking in somebody else's shoes. Wonderful. Thank you. Sure. Uh, Brian, I want to say, Brian or Dr. LJ, is there anything you want to add to that? Go ahead. I'd like to add one more thing about the training and about the policies and everything. Um, it's an advertisement for our human resources. You all are wonderful people. If you want to find a job at an open accepting place, our staff has, some of our staff are a part of the LGBTQ community. And I've only seen as a resident many ways that we're all just people. We're just doing what we're doing. We're living life. So, I mean, if it's policy, if it's training, wonderful. But the life speaks louder than policies and training. Thank you. Thank you. Brian. Hey. Yeah, and just to add to that, I mean, LJ, thanks for mentioning HR. A, a lot of our department heads or all of our department heads were um, included in the SAGE care training so that they can continue to train and have discussions with their staff whenever potential issues might arise or someone just wants additional education surrounding LGBT topics. Um, so I think that's a, a big way that we do that here for the ongoing training in addition to everything that our DIMB does, our subcommittees throughout the campus, not just Pride or Wood. So there's ongoing training conversations from both staff and also our residents here on campus. Okay, great, yep. thank you, thank you. And, and I think the key word is ongoing, that it's not one and done, that it really is that every year there's this, you know, just recognizing, I, I think, 
Cody mentioned the shift, right? From year to year, it, it's not just one thing, there, things shift. And so how do we continue that learning process? Um, Jonathan, go ahead. Yep, our community too is working on our stage care certification. Um, it is, uh, like Josh was mentioning, quite quite a effort to get up and going. Um, and the great thing about it too is it, it, it's exactly ongoing um, as well. So you, you, you do have to recertify as well. Um, like Josh was mentioning too, it's a very thorough training for the management. Um, not only is there an online portal, you know, online component about history, but having those discussions with team members is also very important. Having uh, teams recognize different opinions and different backgrounds and, and ultimately how to make the space more inclusive of everybody as well and inclusive of different opinions with that too. Um, we're rolling it out now to our, so where we're at in our process now is rolling it out to our frontline team. Uh, we've done some um, trainings at our monthly team member meetings, uh, but also SAGE has coordinated with our online training so that residents, so that team members, sorry, can uh, do the, their trainings online as well. Uh, it's really important for our community because uh, we are 24 hours, so we have an overnight staff that may not be able to attend those monthly meetings. So make, making sure that they're still getting a level of knowledge and uh, that ongo on that ongoing basis, the rest of our team members is getting um, has been really important. Um, and uh, again, just conversations and bringing that up is really important for our team members too. Uh, making we a, a challenge, a good challenge that I will see for the future of senior living is that a lot of our team members now are coming from very international backgrounds, places in the world where there is still severe discrimination against LGBT, LGBTQ individuals. And so making sure to have those conversations that we understand and embrace your background while still recognizing that this is our community that we are building to be inclusive of our residents too. Um, so that's really been an important um, talking point um, as, as we go, roll out this training too. Right. Thank you, Jonathan. And I love how both of you mentioned, right, With when it comes to training, it's not just here's the training material, go through it, but it's really generated conversation and understanding of what does that mean to us here and how do we navigate, um, you know, our, our work here and, and uh, the best service we can based on what we've learned through the training. So th thank you for sharing all of that. Cody. Again, I'll probably mimic a lot of what was shared, but SAGE is a beautiful organization. Um, there are different tiers to SAGE. Um, so for Ingleside, we're platinum certified, um, which basically means you are committing to a certain percentile of your entire personnel goes through the training, um, which is a big commitment depending on the tier. But obviously, there's a lot of train the trainer stuff if you go at a, a, a lower level. Um, but the benefits are great. And I love um, I think Jonathan mentioned like the recertification. Um, it's not the same information every year. So when you do the recertification and there's new areas that are covered each year or they'll highlight in those educational um, modules is really pivotal. pivotal. Um, just like we talked about, things change. There's certain things that we really need to expand our knowledge base on. And CARP also is a resource. So if there's things we need to explore more, have a conversation around, we can, once you partner with them, they're a resource that you can always use, um, whether it's materials for education, just to bounce an idea off of, if you need additional support. So I really enjoy um, SAGE. And going back to kind of the hiring process, I think that's where it starts. We have to be um, very mindful in how we market and where we market um, job openings. Like what sites are we using? What language are we using? What type of branding are we using? Um, just again, we start off similar to when residents move in or they're coming in tour. We're starting off with like, this is the culture of our organization. Um, so we're kind of very transparent with it. And then the continuous education. So stage is annual, but we need to go beyond that. So in orientation, do you talk about it in your orientation framework? And then how do you live it beyond just that one hour training each year? So it's that open conversation, um, whether it's your all staff meetings, your leadership meetings, your board meetings, um, for a cultural shift, everyone has to be involved and included. So continuous learning, um, even for the people such as the, us on this call who are leading the efforts in our organizations, we constantly have to be um, absorbing um, and having those conversations. Thank you. Thanks, Cody. Thank you all. You know, and I, I want to highlight what um, what I heard from all of you is really this intentionality um, with 
really creating a culture where LGBTQ plus residents and staff um, will feel like they belong in your communities, right? And once again, whether that's through training, marketing, conversations, and activities, all kinds of ways that ultimately it's being able to say and, and make sure that folks feel like they belong. So thank you, Sophia. Um, I quickly want to make a note. So uh, I know we've already gone through a number of questions, but I did have an attendee um, remind me that if we are using any acronyms, especially in our, our DEI world acronyms, uh, don't forget to explain the acronym uh, when you say it, just because uh, not all of us are speaking the same language. So um, just a quick reminder as we continue on here. Um, and I think we're getting close to uh, a halfway point with our panel. Um, so uh, I will give us a reminder when we're getting ready to um, shift into the Q&A, uh, but I just wanna give everybody a heads up. Um, but the uh, next question that we have um, relates to accessing information um, regarding inclusion in your communities. Um, can you share for the folks in attendance uh, how people can find this information? Um, and if your community has any plans to increase accessibility uh, to this information. This is something that's come up a lot. It's part of the whole theme of our project. So um, just it's very important uh, and sometimes very difficult to uh, ask these questions um, or get answers to these questions very easily. So I'll start again with Josh. Oh, I get to go first again. Nice. I mean, we can we can <laughs> switch it up if you guys want to. All good. Um, no, I, so I, I shared a video a little bit earlier. We actually have a full-blown TV studio here at the community. So a lot of what we're talking about, we can go on television and promote to our residents. You know, we can have these conversations actually in their living room through through the television, which is really um, sort of unique. I, I think last Pride Day, we actually, last Pride Month, we had a resident come out on television to her peers. So these videos uh, we, we share, you can actually access um, a, our website. So we have myerickson.com, uh, myerickson.erickson.com, my I'm sorry, <laughs> that uh, allows you to see some of these videos. It'll tell you different events that are happening um, throughout the campus. Uh, we also, you know, we talked a lot about Priderwood, but any events that Priderwood puts on, I'm always inviting outside people to come and participate. We have a priority list here. So our priority list consists of about 800 members. These are people that have expressed interest and ultimately want to move into Riderwood. So we have exclusive events just for them. We do about 35 different sales and marketing events throughout the year. And that doesn't include, you know, whatever our 250 plus resident groups put on as well. They have access to come out to some of those groups also. Um, so I would say, yeah, if, if you're interested in learning a little bit more, come out to one of our events. You can start by checking out our website uh, or just call LJ. Dr. LJ loves <laughs> conversation. <laughs> right? Well, great. Thank you for uh, sharing, Josh. And um, I guess I have a super quick follow-up question just for you, but um, you mentioned you have about 35 of those uh, marketing events that happen each year. Um, I just yeah. want to know, are any of them specifically planned during Pride Month that focus more on LGBT residents or? So we will usually piggyback on something like the, the parade. Uh, so we will invite our prospects out. Funny enough, I think we had, what do we have, Brian, 10, 10 to 12 prospects that came out for that event, and about half of them actually live here now. So really exciting to see people get involved in our community and ultimately become a part of it. Great. And thank you, um, Jonathan. We'll move on to you. Yeah. Um, good advice for anyone looking for senior living in general. Pick up the phone, give a call, and ask to speak to someone directly. Um, that is really the best way to learn about our inclusion in the community. Uh, but also, this question presents a good uh, area of opportunity for growth for our company and for um, our community in particular as well. Um, I say, you know, reach out to someone directly because we get um, resources that we tailor, but we can't add um, a logo on there, for example, um, for Sage at the moment. 
hopefully that will be down the line something we can do. Uh, we'll definitely get some sort of, you know, some extra materials and collateral to promote that. Um, but sometimes, you know, people may not have the ability to customize their flyers, their marketing events, things like that. Um, so it's always good to speak to someone directly in the community too. Um, but again, I love this question too, because it challenges us um, as senior living providers to say, what can we do to make sure someone doesn't have to pick up that phone? What what can we do to, again, make sure that they know they will be welcome the minute that they, they walk in the door before they even pick up the phone too. Um, again, our website doesn't have anything directly there. There's some great blog resources, things like that. But because we have so many communities across the country, there's nothing specifically that our community can put on there to say, yes, we welcome you, please come in. Um, so again, great opportunities for growth that, that will be coming and changing. Um, but again, pick up the phone, give us a call. We'd love to talk to you too. Thank you, Jonathan, again, for that transparency um, and for recognizing that, you know, there is still a lot of work at times to be done. Um, and Cody, we're gonna turn to you if you'd like to add on. Sure, so we um, do this in a number of ways. So our Ingleside and Color, which is the name of our Diversity, Equity, Inclusion, Belonging Committee. And um, we have a, our own dedicated LinkedIn page. So we're able to kind of market some of the things that we are doing along with just having some educational opportunities because uh, we don't want to just highlight the program, but the people who are um, absorbing that information or seeing it, we want to give little tidbits for them to do some reflection on. Um, we have a number of subcommittees. I know, I think Joshua and his team mentioned there's a lot of, there's like a bigger committee than subcommittees and we kind of have a similar nature. Um, we uh, have a master calendar programming committee. So basically we break down all of the different subject areas that you can think of um, on a diversity calendar. And we have a conversation amongst our committee of how we want to show representation. As you know, there's hundreds and hundreds of things that are represented on this month or this day. And we wanna take a look at um, what our priority population looks like. Does this make sense for our community? What things do we need to have a program around? What are things we need to have just maybe a little article on. Um, so it's a conversation so we don't feel like anyone's excluded. And it's inevitable you're gonna have people come up like, well, you didn't share this specific subject matter um, or represent this specific day. And that's great feedback, but it starts the conversation because they see that we're extra proactive on highlighting these specific days and months. So that program planning committee has been really beneficial. Um, we also have a newsletter committee. So each community has their own like newsletter, but we have a specific Ingleside and Color newsletter um, where we'll highlight a program from the previous quarter, we'll do some education on the subject, and we'll highlight all of those areas we have listed in our program calendar as well. Again, visual representation, making sure it's part of the conversation on a consistent basis is where you're going to see a lot of ch uh, change in your organization. Um, we are really proactive in our digital transformation. So similar to Joshua shared about like streaming some of your events and programs so more people can participate or listen in um, is really important because as you know, the abilities of people vary. So whether we need to have it accessible in their apartments, whether we need subtitles because of vision, whether it's hearing, um, we wanna make sure that these efforts around LGBT are we're able to reach as many people as possible and meet them where they're at. Um, I think another piece of really um, collecting information and exploring and expanding our efforts is our collaborations. And so I just wanna to touch on that for a second. So obviously we talked about SAGE, but our communities are really, um, invested in working with, so like I'm part of the leading age Maryland and DC chapters um, to get feedback, see what's working well in other communities, what barriers those communities are facing. And we need to be able to partner with people in the field because it's just, it's a big undertaking and we're, um, there's always gonna be gaps and bouncing things off of each other is so beneficial. Um, so I strongly 
uh, recommend anyone on this call, if you have the chance to join a committee where you can collaborate, it's such a powerful thing. Um, we also partner with like the Washington Blade. We always have articles where we'll put in a story um, in there so we can get the word out. Um, and that varies on what type of content we share. Like we highlighted last year of a um, two gentlemen that got married in our community and had a reception within our community. Um, just beautiful events like that. Um, and I would say uh, the last thing is something similar to what Jonathan said, how when you're with a big organization, you have a lot of different barriers and challenges when you want to add to your marketing materials. Um, it's really imperative. And I think with Ingleside, since we're smaller, we have a little bit of an advantage there is alignment with your C-suite and your governing policies and your board. If they're aligned and have that buy-in, then you'll be able to make um, more efforts um, in those different um, venues when it comes to um, communicating um, these different programs. Well, thank you for everyone for sharing that wealth of, of information about information. But um, Cody, especially, that was, I think, a very uh, in-depth answer. And you covered a lot of uh, different important areas there. Um, and I'm, again, cognizant now of time. Um, Dr. Jen, I think we got time for at least one question, maybe two more. I can already see some Q&A questions rolling in, so folks are eager to get to that. So um, I think we'll be able to fit in maybe two more. Um, so feel free to go ahead. That sounds great. All right. So the next question is around what you have observed throughout your time and experience at in your communities. Um, so since you started working um, at your communities, have you noticed a change in LGBTQ plus um, inclusion and acceptance, um, positive as well as, you know, any challenges that have arisen? So we'll start with Josh. Yeah, I would say in the last couple of years, uh, I hope that we're doing something right because, you know, when couples come in now, they are disclosing. It's, it's my wife and I, you know, it's, it, it used to be, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to come and I'm going to live with my friend. Um, it wasn't always brought to our attention right up front. So I, I hope that this culture we've created and, you know, is being seen. I, I feel that in the last couple of years, that, that difference in those initial appointments, seeing the campus, um, people are are genuine with us right up front and and sharing. Um, Dr. LJ, I didn't know if you wanted to add on here. Um, I know you you recently, you know, you've been here over a year now, um, but your story here would be good as well. Well, uh, you know, the the changes <laughs> historic hysterically, <laughs> whatever. I thought I moved here, <laughs> <laughs> um, but um, you know, meeting. Um, members of our tribe, so to speak, who come and live the life because we have a live the life program um, as uh, it was shared earlier. There was one gentleman that my wife and I uh, visited with because he was coming as a single uh, individual. And one thing that he did, um, he had a meal pass, you know, from the sales office, and and he was invited to spend time around Riderwood. And he shared with us that as he would meet new people, he would just out himself, I'm gay, because he was curious what their reaction would be. And he told me he never received a surprised reaction. It was just totally open and accepted. Oh. Okay, you know it's like <laughs> yeah. I was born in Washington State. Oh, okay, that's interesting. Um, and so I'm just finding, and I think this is a change, maybe in the people who are coming from my generation versus my mother's generation because there was a couple who came and we were having supper with them and their list of questions. They didn't have any questions about LGBT life here at Riderwood. Mm -hmm. All of their questions were like everybody else. So I'd say 
significant change, it's just very positive. It's no different than when I came. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Jonathan. Yeah, uh, great stories from Joshua and, and L Dr. LJ. Very similar experiences. A again, just not that nonchalance, but just that accepting of saying his husband, her wife, um, they are coming at 2 p.m. Just building that into the day and making that so much more a part of our language um, has been the biggest change I've seen. Um, I start, like I mentioned, been with this community for a while. Um, and I remember when I started, it was one of the t uh, around the time of the first Supreme Court uh, cases regarding um, same-sex marriage. And I, I, in activities at that time, was leading a discussion, current events discussion, and got kind of nervous saying, you know, gay marriage and things like that. And one of the res and, and especially because, uh, like we're talking about generationally, those are residents that were born 19 teens, 1920s. Um, I wasn't sure how they would react. And again, one resident that was in their 80s, uh, early 90s, just, well, who cares? Um, I think definitely being in a major metropolitan area in, in a um, region that has been so accepting and, and leading the charge in so many ways for LGBT, LGBTQ plus acceptance um, over the years has been a major part of that. Um, and has now translated to, again, just that, that comfort level with it throughout our days and, and using various language and making sure that other team members are comfortable with that language, understand that language um, as well. Thanks, Jonathan. It, it's so great. Well, you know, once again, the stories and experiences to hear that shift. Cody. Yeah, I would say it's just a, a similar shift with the Ingleside communities. Just people feel a little bit more comfortable to um, have um, speak honestly and truly um, without having to second guess it as much um, as it might have been a few years back. I think being part of the DMV does play a factor in that. Um, we have had um, a slow growth of LGBT residents or ones that are out in our communities. Um, but one thing I always kind of talk about is it's their friends and their family members are stakeholders too. So being in the DMV where their loved ones can come in and feel safe and accepted to visit their parents with their partner um, is something that we take um, of critical importance as well. Um, so just making sure um, that we keep a pulse on that. Um, I think from both a, uh, staff perspective and a resident perspective, people are just coming in authentically themselves a little bit more with ease. I know, just speaking personally, when I came to the organization, um, I was always very comfortable sharing that I'm a gay male, but um, there's always a spirit and a culture of inclusivity, but it wasn't talked about. It wasn't in the forefront of conversation or the programming as much as it is now. Um, and now seeing people come in and because it's part of the conversation, because there's posters, there's signs, there's programs, people just are able to do that a little bit more readily, I would say. Wonderful. I, I love these stories around the shifts. It, it just sounds like more openness. And, and we talked about generational differences, too. And, and I think we're definitely seeing and experiencing more of that. Thank you all. Sophia. All righty. Well, this has been um, truly a fantastic uh, conversation. Um, and I know we could go on for much longer, but uh, I'm going to say this is our, our last question for our panelists, and then we're going to shift over to the Q&A. Um, and we've already, again, accrued so many folks who are, are very eager to ask questions. Um, but our final question really just is, and I wanted to give you all the opportunity um, if you'd like to share anything, you know, that doesn't fit in a nice little compact question, um, anything that you want to share about your community or about inclusion or about um, experiences for LGBT folks or prospective folks, um, you know, now is now a great time to do that and just want to provide you with the space to do so. So, uh, Josh, I will pass it to you for the final time. <laughs> I, I mean, I, I think I've cover you know what opportunities we do have here i, I really do encourage you um, to reach out you just give us a call here and we can set up a tour let's let's see the community together i want to introduce you to some residents here 
Um, I, I tell people all the time when I when I do a presentation, I want to make sure that our community passes your vibe check, right? When you walk into the community, you should feel like you belong. If you don't, it's not the right community. I might be the only sales director that stands up there and says, hey, go look at all these other communities. Everybody's represented. I, I encourage you, look at all of them because it makes more sense. It, it's going to be community living. All of us are going to want you to thrive and be happy in that community and add value to the community that you're in. So certainly spend time, you know, looking at the different communities uh, and then, you know, multiple times. It's, it's not like you, you visit one time and you get it, it especially Riderwood. It's a, it's a huge place. You want to come multiple times, experience all aspects of our community. And I'm certainly here. Uh, we're all here to help you do that. Thank you, Josh. Um, pass that to Jonathan. Yeah. Um, Sunrise has been a great company to work for um, for the last decade. And, and again, I, I think a lot of it, like Josh was saying, it's, it's about community. Um, and so it's it's hard to build community sometimes. And it, it takes um, people to challenge that a lot of times too. And uh, challenging us to do things at the ground level, uh, making sure that we're, again, inclusive as we can be, and to bring it up to that policy and procedural level too. Um, and we are always ready for new residents to make us their home um, because that's what assisted living is designed for, to, to be home. It's not just a place where, you're, where you live. Um, it's, and that's important to, to be, have that inclusivity um, at that place where you're laying your head to have that, that welcome, that vibe check. Like Joshua said, it's very important. Okay, Cody, we're gonna wrap it up with you. Sure. Um... I would just say with um, Ingleside, the, the key is having a strategy behind it and being committed to it. So we have um, objectives in our strategic plan um, that are that flow into your operations plans and your day-to-day -day and your frontline education, like it's very holistic. I think that's really imperative um, that it shows that much importance that it is all the way up into your strategic plan and aligns with the mission and vision of your organization. Um, and as we've talked many times throughout this um, panel is the continuous education. Um, one thing that really has always stood out with me and um, Jennifer Moranya actually opened my eyes a lot to this is um, the difference between equity and equality, right? We want to be equitable and everyone's needs are different. And that kind of goes back to person-centered care um, is that not every, we can't just provide a one, package deal we need to be looking holistically and that kind of again touches on everything we've shared today so i won't get too much into it um yeah just making sure all facets of your operation that it's not just the committee it's not just the program it gets into your dining services your housekeeping your marketing every department plays a role and create that that culture around um, deib and continue to push through the barriers because you're going to face a lot of barriers every day when it comes to your efforts here, but with the understanding that it's with a good cause and a good mission that um, it's worthwhile. Thank you for that, Cody. And um, I know uh, talking about equity versus um, quality, that that is, it's another hour of conversation that uh, could be had. Um, but I'm now, I'm going to stop the recording. Um,